Well, I think that's how he. They, they certainly composed. A, a lot of the lyrics were composed that way, I think, and a lot of lyricists do write like that, I believe. Speaking as a complete non-expert, <laughs> but of course that doesn't stop one sounding off. Absolutely, as I'm sure you'll do now. Well, perhaps not as eloquently or in such detail yes. as yourself, Doctor B, because well, I don't really have your professional location in the Kennedy study. <laughs> Well, you teach civil rights. Yeah. You teach the South. Right, Here. Yeah. Back. I'm, what do you call that professionally? Cording or something? <laughs> <laughs> the cord is showing. <clears throat> do I look really stiff and artificial? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> No. Because that's the look I'm trying for. That's okay. right. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about that, though. No. Yeah, tighten on your muscles, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially if you're going to Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, start off, tell me your name, where you're from, what you do. Uh, my name is David Waller. I'm from Northampton in England, and I'm a university professor in American history and politics at the University College in Northampton. And where were you born? I was born in Luton in Bedfordshire, which is about 30 miles north of London. And you raised there, spent most of your life there? No, in fact, I was raised in Northampton itself. Moved there at a tender age of two months. And what made you become an American history professor? Um, I read history for my first degree at university. Uh, in fact, I was a classical historian when I began my studies. Uh, and I would say that I remain generally interested in all fields of history uh, to this day, but in my final year of university study, I took some classes in modern American history, in fact, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. And uh, I had the feeling of happening upon a period of history that fascinated me out of all proportion to anything else. And that really was what put me onto the track of being specifically an Americanist, and I remain that way today. Um, I, I think one of the joys, really, of studying American history is, particularly of the, the early 20th century, is that you can see the foundations of, of contemporary America being laid in that period. And that, I think, makes the historical study very interesting, because you're, you're studying the evolution of what you see around you in America today. So it does seem very, very relevant, more so than, let us say, history of thousands of years ago. Um, my colleague and I are returning from a conference in Santiago in Chile and uh, we're flying with American Airlines and the return flight was through Dallas and having discovered that we specifically arranged a long layover so we would have enough time to come downtown and see some historical sites which time allowing or given the shortness of the time effectively just meant the first most important thing was to see Dealey Plaza. And what was, uh, what was it in Chile that the conference was held? Uh, it was the International Congress of Americanists, which was a gathering of several hundred scholars in different fields of American studies, literature, politics, <sighs> economics, philosophy, as well as history. And we were giving a paper on Anglo-American relations in the mid-19th century. So nothing to do with <laughs> Kennedy or anything more contemporary. <laughs> Um, I would give the same answer, only what I read on the plaque and managed to forget. I, I think perhaps that he was one of the founding fathers of the city. Um, what did strike me, however, about looking at the area over there where the Kennedy Memorial is located is that the square, I think I'm right in saying the, current, the modern square was laid out by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s. And of course, that interested me as a New Deal historian. So that much I remembered. Um, when we first walked down the, the slope of the square and saw the concrete structures on either side, my first impression was that this was, in fact, a Kennedy memorial, or would be a Kennedy memorial. I was a little surprised to get up close and see that it wasn't, but in fact it was much, much earlier and dated from the interwar period. Yeah. 
He was. He was for Texas, yes. And uh, this was kind of fell under his department. So that would certainly make sense, yes. He was a great one at bringing home the bacon, Lyndon. <laughs> My own view is it would probably be very, very similar. I think most American presidents are in office for such a short period of time, it's very, very difficult for one individual to make a significant difference. Unless you have a concatenation of international events of extreme importance. I mean, if there had been a third world war during John Kennedy's presidency, had he survived, let us say, then yes, undoubtedly his decisions would have been fundamental, as was the case with, say, Franklin Roosevelt during the Second World War. But if, if Kennedy had been a one or even two-term peacetime president, I don't really think the modern United States would be significantly different today. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there a little bit. <laughs> Did you see the uh, Oliver Stone? I have seen the Oliver Stone film, but not for a few years. I think I've seen it about a couple of times. And I'm not a film historian, so What's I don't... Impression of it as a person? Um, I think it's a very effective film. It's certainly very effective emotionally. Um, but I think uh, its, its portrayal of history is not objective. That's to be expected, I think, with a Hollywood film. There's no reason why it should be. I don't think it's fair to criticise Stone for saying that his historical portrayal of Kennedy as a president is not objective because I think that's irrelevant but um, I, I don't have a deep impression of the film beyond that so um, you know I, I don't have any further conclusions on it. Do you have any uh, conclusions of your own on uh, what happened that day? Actually no. Um, I remain a skeptic in the sense that I'm open-minded. Uh, if I were forced to say whether I think Oswald did it or not, I would say I see no reason why he couldn't. Uh, the lone gunman theory to me is wholly persuasive. I, I think he was just lucky. I think we look for conspiracy theories too readily in history and, and we don't give enough or pay enough attention to the role that luck plays in human events. Uh, I think he just hit John Kennedy by accident and could equally well have missed. Yes, I do. Um, John Kennedy and his death uh, has been a, an established feature of modern American history and we go and visit far less significant historical um, sites around the United States and in other countries. Um, certainly historians do. You know, They go to the birthplaces of the most obscure presidents, so I don't see why they wouldn't come to the, the place of death of one of the most famous. Did uh, Kennedy's, uh, Kennedy's story affect you personally in any way? I wouldn't say it affected me personally in the sense of changing the direction of my life, but it's something that my generation in Britain has, has always been aware of from a relatively early age. I would say everybody my age knew of John Kennedy and his death by the time that they were an adolescent because of the reason that my colleague mentioned, which is that our parents could, nearly all of them, say and re that they could remember where they were when, when Kennedy was shot. Um, I, I cannot, although <laughs> I was alive at the time, but I was only three weeks old, so I, I'd been told what I was doing at the time, but I can't remember it. <laughs> okay. Have you uh, ever encountered people that had a negative reaction to that on the no, not in the United Kingdom. I think because we're not so directly associated with the politics of the Kennedy presidency or anything that has flowed from that, for people outside the United States, it is simply an event of historical importance, if you can have such a thing. I mean, if, if a, an event of a historical importance could be simple, it's not one, I think, which carries um, a negative connotation in that sense. Um, uh, I, I think of its historical development in, in Texas, I suppose um, uh, there would be 
as my colleague said, the, the modern cultural reference to the television series, which I didn't watch because <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't into that kind of thing back then. But um, uh, yeah, I, I guess I just think about Dallas as representative of, of Texas and leave it at that. No, I think it would be very comprehensive. Okay. You should mention about students. Have you well, that is true, yes. Every year we do get a number of students who are determined to write the equivalent of the senior thesis on the Kennedy assassination, a number of whom are convinced that they have solved it. They will come to me or, or to my colleague and wishing our supervision in, in the, the thesis and saying, you know, I want to do this piece of work because I, I've worked it all out. And we had a guy about three years ago who, who had come to Dallas the summer before and he'd photographed this area and he bought a city map and he put that into the piece of work as well. I'm afraid as a piece of history it was rather flawed and it wasn't a, a good piece of research, but it's certainly indicative of a, of a phenomenon among a certain number of, of young people in Britain and I suppose in other countries outside the United States, a phenomenon of fascination with Kennedy for various reasons. He is still regarded as a, a liberal saint, I think, among, and, and idealized to a degree by people from a, another culture who, of course, are born 20 years after he died, which is interesting in itself. Yeah, um, I guess in American terms, I'd want to describe myself as a Jeffersonian Republican. <laughs> um, <years> yes, <laughs> having flown overnight from Santiago, <laughs> I feel like it. <laughs> um, do you have any sense from your students of what theories are more popular or what they tend to believe about it? Well, I, beyond the fact that they think there was a conspiracy, I think there's there's no common denominator within those. Um, although I suppose following Oliver Stone there is a tendency to say that it was the security services of the United States. Uh, I believe that's what Stone says. Although as I say I only seen the film a couple of times and that was a long time ago but the elements within the government removed the president rather than say the mafia for instance. One told us there were six shooters. Yes, and they placed them. Yeah, that's right. His company was the only one to have done the research. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the guy I uh, um, talked to yesterday, actually. He, he couldn't decide yesterday if there were six or nine. <laughs> <laughs>